Welcome to the Twitch verse. We are so excited you are here. It is another session of building happy little APIs. And I'm, I'm really excited about this one. First of all, I'm in the studio, which is always fun. And I have a great panel of experts. Uh, these are quotes, uh, just so you know, uh, and that, that are going to be answering your questions today. I've been excited about this session. I know a lot of you have, so let's get started. I want to I want to first take a moment and introduce my my uh, panel of esteemed experts here. Uh, so Ryan, this is Ryan Waite. I would love for you to tell, tell them who you are and what you do. I'm Ryan Waite. I'm the director for API Gateway. Okay, good. Uh, and hopefully, uh, people <laughs> and did you want that, the big version? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, people remember me from the previous episodes of uh, Happy Little APIs. But uh, I'm Bob Kinney. I'm one of the senior engineers on API Gateway. This is Bob the Beard Kinney. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. And I made a guest appearance in the first episode. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm a senior product manager with Amazon API Gateway. That's right. Uh, really honestly, we put together a panel of experts. We also have with us, he's not in, in the room today, but we have George Mao, who is a really smart guy, so I've heard, uh, and has proven that over and over, so he's joining us as well. Uh, but he'll be, he'll be answering questions on the Twitch chat. Uh, so we're going to get started. A couple things I'll tell you guys real quick. Um, one, this is not a community cup. Don't drink out of my cup. Okay, <laughs> or you will get one finger. Just throwing that out there. Okay, um, we we are going to answer any questions we can. Hopefully, you'll be putting them through on on Twitch. I'll be monitoring, uh, and then uh, we're going to get started here. So, let's uh, let me do the first. Let me ask the first question. We're gonna we're gonna put Ryan on the spot here. Okay, so as you know, this session. I'm, there it is. So as you know, this session is, is or the, this series is all about API Gateway and, and the magic that it is and the beauty that it is. And, and uh, Ryan is the new director of API Gateway. Um, and so what I would love to hear from you is a couple of things. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. Uh, and then tell us what is the future of API Gateway? If, if you could say, and I'm not asking you to give away the secrets, you know, that, that'll get specifically me fired, but I'm asking you to tell us what, what do you see as the future of API Gateway? What do you see API Gateway's you know, function and role? Awesome, okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm a boomerang for uh, Amazon. So I was here in 2010 or 2011. I, I uh, built some services like Kinesis and Kinesis Firehose. Uh, left Amazon and went to work for a company called Cray, the supercomputing company. Uh, had a great time there and then came back to work on API Gateway. and. Uh, I think the potential for API Gateway is, is enormous. It's a super popular service. It's growing like crazy. Uh, and, and one of the pieces of feedback we get is that we could, we could do so much better if we were to simplify the way that API Gateway works and uh, make it a lot easier for people to integrate API Gateway with the existing services that they're using. Because if, if you think about what API Gateway does, it, it acts as the front door to some of your, your business logic. And that logic could be running inside of Lambda, it could be running uh, as part of a Kinesis stream, it could be uh, logic that's in Elastic MapReduce. There's so many different types of, of uh, applications and logic that people want to expose, and they need a safe and secure and scalable way to do that, and that's what API Gateway does. Uh, so one of the things we'll be thinking about as we go forward is like, how do we make that easier for, for people to do? Instead of you know the, the I'd say incredible sophistication we have, we have some people that just want a simple solution, and so we're going to be thinking more about how we do that as we go forward, okay. and make it super easy to integrate with with other AWS services. And part of that's built in right now, but we know that we can do better there too. Uh, another thing that we're looking at is is the kinds of protocols that people want to use, and we we did private API support recently and WebSocket uh, support recently, and I want to talk about those a little bit because it at at Amazon, you know, we kind of you know, went through this microservice architecture revolution a long time ago, and part of what happened as part of that was we, we built That's all right. these yeah. small services, yeah. and, and we'd every now and then occasionally do a, a denial of service attack against ourselves. You know, somebody would make a code change in one service, and they'd go from like, 10 transactions per second against this other service to like a million, and this other service would I pop was over. New. It, it yeah. happens. It's like, eh, you yeah. know, second day at work, <laughs> small check-in. That's right. Dead. So um, we learned a long time ago that we had to do a really good job of protecting our internal APIs as well, not just external APIs. And part of what we did with API Gateway was to provide that same support with private APIs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we want to spend more time talking with customers and showing the value that comes out of that because for some of your, you don't have to do it for every internal API, but for the really critical ones that you've got, you might want to think about how do you how do you protect that resource and kind of segment the different clients that are talking to it so your most important clients always get through and uh, other clients can be throttled if you're under a lot of load. 
uh, WebSockets is, an, is another uh, protocol that we're supporting. It's been, it's been very popular, and it enables an entirely new category of, of API gateway applications. Yeah. And the uptake on this has been great. Uh, we're, uh, we're getting lots of great requests, and we're continuing to address those requests, but I'm, I'm super excited about API, so API gateway and WebSockets. One of the things I love about WebSockets is, um, and I know as, as, as developers, okay, we're building out, let's say we have to build a server in the background for, for API Gateway, we've got to build, we've got to handle the, the WebSockets and everything like that. The cool thing about WebSockets, and you guys could correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you will, um, <laughs> uh, is, is really, we can take an existing application and fairly easily convert it to WebSockets by using the API Gateway, correct? Um, so, so by by you know, I, you know, we get you know the IDs and we pass that around. But but I don't I don't I don't have to do anything different in Lambdas um, other than maybe how I respond a little bit, and I can still do a lot of the same logic. And I think that was kind of kind of a, a, a magic uh, magic trick, so to speak. Yes. Uh, I, I love how we did that and said, okay, we can take and abstract that away from you. And it's what AWS is so good at is and say we'll, we'll handle that for you. And kind of let you let you deal with that. So I love the idea of, of uh, web sockets. So. Yeah, I, right. you know, the last area I think we're going to do, uh, we'll put more attention into is just the way that we manage APIs mm -hmm. going forward. Uh, we have a great dev portal right now. It's available on GitHub so that customers can take you know this this kind of API portal and modify it any way that you need to with your business. And every customer that we talk to about this has different ideas of what they need and has to integrate with different types of backend logic that's part of of their business. It's part of the way that they they think about their business. Uh, and so we've provided all of that as source, uh, but we just have a lot more that we can do in, in the space of helping people as they build new APIs, as they evolve those APIs, as they want to version those APIs. There's you know, a lot of things that we can do in that, in that yeah. space. So we'll, we'll be putting a lot of attention there too. Very cool, very cool. Um, one of the episodes that we did uh, a while back was called Shut the Front Door. Have you heard of that one? Mm -hmm. uh, can you say shut the front door? Shut the front door. There you go. That was the first <laughs> question we had was to get you to say shut the front door. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, someone tell Richard to go home. And so, <laughs> uh, yeah. So here is an, an actual legitimate question. Going back to like the, the, the denial of service we were joking about earlier, but yeah. can API Gateway, uh, let, me, let me read the question here, Do, or I'm sorry, WAF, can WAF help with, with denial of service internally? Uh, so yes, uh, so you definitely can set up okay. a, uh, a WAF rule. So um, you can directly associate WAF uh, with API Gateway, and that includes even uh, private APIs. Um, so uh, you could set up the same uh, sort of rules-based uh, filtering that you would get with a public API with a private API, whether that be um, IP-based filtering or request-based filtering that is available in WAF. Excellent, okay, very cool. Alrighty. So as you know, this is Bob the Beard. He doesn't go by Bob the Beard. I call him that. Um, Bob, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do. I know. I know we introduced yourself, but what's sure. your background? Yeah. So, um, so I've been with the company for about seven and a half years now. Uh, so prior to working on API Gateway, I helped launch uh, Amazon Cognito. Um, and prior to that, I was working on our mobile SDKs, uh, so specifically for iOS and Android. Um, uh, so, and then prior to that, I've uh, you know had a, a laundry list of uh, um, prior careers, whether it was uh, doing um, systems engineering uh, or what they now call DevOps. Uh, so, um, actually building uh, out data centers uh, for a university that I used to work for back on the East Coast. Nice. All righty, and George. Not George, Alan. How's that going? I was I thinking know. George yeah, is doing a great George. job. George is doing all the work right now, answering questions. So, Alan, I apologize. Um, you can the, call me anything you want. So, Bob. We're right. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> okay. right. Sorry, your face is a little too short. Yeah, everybody wants right. to be Bob. All right, give us your background. Um, so I'm Canadian. I grew up in Canada. Um, I've been with Amazon for about a year and a half. I've been in the cloud space for a much longer time than that. Um, but yeah, it's been really fun at Amazon. And it's been really great being able to lead the API Gateway product and working with Ryan, a lot of smart people here. OK. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, all right, I have another question for you guys. So will subsequent messages, so we're back to the WebSockets idea. Will subsequent messages on a social, <laughs> on, excuse me, on a socket potentially hit different containers is what's asked here, but what we mean is execution environments. Um, will, will they hit a uh, the same one, or will they potentially hit different ones? Uh, so I mean, in, in 
the executions of a WebSocket message, like an inbound message from a client, is no different than uh, a REST API request uh, okay. that was going to the same um, same Lambda function. Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, so the, there is a potential that um, it is not a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, we don't maintain a Lambda function um, for each connection that is a, they, they are actually distinct. Um, so when a message comes in, um, that request goes to the Lambda service, and the Lambda service decides whether or not to spin up a new um, execution environment or not. So Lambda is not aware that it's socket or REST. It just is aware of the request uh, coming in. It, it, like, I mean, it, it will have contextual, contextual information, yeah, exactly, but so. it's not aware whether or not it's a socket or REST. Okay. Yep. All right, excellent. Okay. All right, so now we're going to jump into some questions, see what you guys think here. Okay. So one of the questions we get a lot of times, okay, and this is an architectural question. We might have, you know, some different opinions, but there's a discussion about monolithic lambdas, okay? Now, and I, I know right now, Bob, don't roll your eyes yet. Let me, let me finish <laughs> the question, okay? So the discussion about monolithic lambdas and should they be used? And, and just for those who, who aren't, you know, because you hear us talk all the time, monolithic versus microservice. And wait a minute, if lambda is a microservice, how can it be monolithic? Well, the idea of a monolithic lambda is that it's kind of your, it's your entire application in one, right? And and sometimes, some I've seen folks that do, here's my Lambda, and then it might call different services based on context, but it's all handled at one Lambda. Now, others say, hey, I think you should do a lot of different Lambdas. I want, uh, you know, and, and break it down. I want to hear what you all think as developers. Um, what what do you think, uh, how should that break out? Do you want to start? And we can fill I'm going to start with, no, don't use a monolithic lambda. Okay. And then I will let Bob dive into the details <laughs> Tell the of why. why. <laughs> Are you taking credit for the answer there? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> All right. I was sharing. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I mean, so the the thing I will say is is that um, obviously a lot of these decisions will based on your organization and sort of your API lifecycle. So if you're a single developer, kind of like working on um, a small project, you know, monolithic API might be okay because you're only the, the only person committing yeah. the code. You're the only one who's pushing anything, um, not necessarily going to run into a lot of problems. But as your, you know, as your business grows, as your organization grows, you're eventually going to have multiple developers that are going to want to change different parts of the application, and you're going to want to be able to push each one of those independently. Um, so actually having a separate Lambda for each one of those things will allow you to have uh, each um, uh, each portion of your API to have a different velocity. Um, so, the, you know, some sometimes you might have um, uh, one portion of your API that might need uh, a little bit more um, speed of iteration on on deployments, um, and so that would allow you to do that. The other nice thing, uh, the other nice aspect of uh, of, of separating out the the APIs um, to per lambdas is that uh, you get the per lambda metrics. So um, on API Gateway, you can also get fine grained um, metrics on your per on our route basis uh, inside of your REST API. Uh, so you can actually see the um, the number of requests, the latency per um, invocation on that on that REST path. But then you can also see the same thing on the lambda function. But you only get that if you actually have sort of that one to one mapping of this path on my REST API goes to this lambda function. You can very clearly see the the association of okay this REST API and this function, um, I can see the end-to-end -end metrics. So, so like that gives you a nice separation um, on both sides of the equation. Right, and then also some of the features in API Gateway actually work at the per path level, and you can actually uh, override or define it in a fi more fine-grained level. Yeah. So if you have one monolith lambda, they're really, uh, any single throwing limit, for example, would be applied to the whole Lambda function, yep. whereas if you split it out per path, you can actually say, uh, maybe the post, you know, we don't really want as much of uh, as high limit, maybe it's 100 or something. Okay. For all the gets, we can maybe do 1,000. So it actually gives you a bit more fine grain control Absolutely. as well. You guys did a good talk earlier about using Hexray with uh, API Gateway yeah. and Lambdas. And it's a, it's a great way to be able to understand as you're building out your code and you have this big monolithic application, uh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. where do you want to be able to do optimizations, you know, in some cases versus not optimize in other cases? If it's one big monolithic application, sometimes that's a little bit harder to pull apart. Absolutely. Then that's if right. you, you know, compartmentalized your code a little bit better, broken it out, and you're able to optimize really important paths more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add to that in, in the standard, you know, when, when we just talk about monolithic versus mi microservices, not Lambda, but just in general, you know, the, the argument against it a lot is, is <clears throat> monolithic becomes brittle, right? If, if I break, because no, I don't, my code is generally, you know. Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Um, but, but 
when when we send out bad code, your whole app is dead. When when you're when you're monolith, even with the monolithic lambda, if if it's crashing, it's crashing. You know, lambda is awesome, but it can't overcome your bad code sometimes. <laughs> so uh, so that's a really good thing to understand. So so when you're breaking those out, you may lose part of your service by by having a microservice, but not the entire thing. And so you, so your application is much more resilient. Um, so some great answers. I, I am going to give Bob the credit for that one. Uh, I felt like he talked longer. I wish we had a little thing like ding, Bob. So, uh, but I'm gonna Plus give you one. like three tenths. So, no, I'm just kidding. You did great. That was okay, awesome. Three okay, three tenths. So, yeah, no, some, yeah, some great answers. So, okay, uh, very cool. So I'm checking uh, to see. Yes, we do blame the developer a lot. Uh, works on my desk. So someone said typical blame the developer. We're so thinking it is the their developer. Code, right? Yeah, exactly. So works on my desk does not actually do that. So. Uh, George is doing an amazing job. George is really doing the lion's share of the work here, just so you guys know. Uh, we're just goofing off and drinking soda. So, um, But, George, thank you very much. Um, uh, all right, so so I got this. It's not a question. It's just a statement. I'm using a lot of API Gateway with serverless and Lambda. It's really cool. Thank you. We're glad you yeah, like it. Awesome. So, yes, these are thumbs, and I love you. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, very cool. All right, so another question, and this kind of goes back off based on on what we were just talking about, um, because what what I find, and, and I'll expound on this a little bit here because I, I do like to talk. Um, what I found is is when people start with serverless and start with API Gateway, they generally do the proxy, right? That's that's just kind of where we start. You know, even in the dash, so I do a proxy, I set up, especially if you use SAM because that's the default in SAM, unless I actually add a definition, right? So so we see a lot of proxy. And, and sometimes we see that people never leave that, especially if they're using a, a monolithic lambda because they're taking a lot of the a lot of the, the power of API Gateway and they're kind of writing it themselves in lambda, right? Um, so, so that begs the question, where do you draw the line? What do you tell people when, hey, maybe you should look at using an ALB instead of, uh, instead of API Gateway? Where do you all draw that line? Do you want to go first, or so? I mean, yeah. I mean, the, okay. we kind of already talked to, touched a little bit on some of these issues, but like, you know, obviously, um, so there is WAF integration, obviously, with with ALB, but um, sort of some of the other aspects of uh, um, API gateways uh, DDoS protection or mechanisms for controlling access to the API are not available with the ALB integration. Um, so uh, authentication outside of Cognito is not available um, with the ALB integration. So API Gateway offers um, full-fledged uh, custom authorization as well as uh, native uh, AWS IAM integration. Um, there's also throttling, uh, so actually being able to assert um, throttling limits on a per route basis, as well as being able to configure um, uh, throttling rates on a per caller basis using API keys. Um, what, am I, what, am I, what am I forgetting here, Alan? Caching. Ca oh yeah, so caching, caching. so implementing yeah, yeah. caching so that you don't even have to call the Lambda backend integration. Um, so these are like these are the set, um, a set of features that uh, are uh, value adds that API Gateway offers that um, are, are slightly above the, the ALB proxy integration. Yeah, and I think, I'd, oh, go oh, ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I, you know, ALB is, is, a, is a fantastic load balancing product, but as, as customers start off with proxy integrations, mm -hmm. it's very natural to start going down a path of like, oh, I wish I could shift something a little bit differently, yeah. or I have some sort of code on the back end that responds in a particular way, but I need to transform it in some way so that it replies to my clients a little bit more right. effectively. API Gateway has you know VTL transformations built in that, that help with that kind of uh, functionality, or you know, I need to have multiple clients calling my API, but I want to make sure that some of them always get preferential treatment for coming through versus other clients. And, mm -hmm. and that ability to use API keys or throttling is, as we were just talking about, uh, it's super important. And and it's part of what you get when you use an API product like API Gateway. Right. And I guess the other the other thing would be is like if, uh, um, you know, obviously we've been talking a lot about Lambda specifically, but um, API Gateway also directly integrates with other AWS services yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that would be another uh, another avenue where if they if a customer was like trying to do um, uh, direct uh, um, data to Kinesis Firehose as an example to collect analytics analytics data, um, that's a common use case we've seen from from customers. Then then that right. would be something that would not be available. Um, well. I guess theoretically, you could uh, you could have your your ALB going to a Lambda, going to Kinesis Firehose, but then then you're paying you know so you're paying for the ALB, you're paying for the Lambda, yeah, 
and you're also paying for the fire hose, whereas like if you just paid for um, the API gateway, you might have a slightly less cost there. Right, and then if, you, if you're using ALB and all, some of these features that you need, you'll, you'll have to build in your backend logic, as you mentioned, right? Yeah, Whether that's right. in a Lambda or in an EC2 somewhere. Um, and so then once you start spinning up more and more microservices, you're actually going to find yourself building these shared infrastructure type functionality and mm. replicating it, mm. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you have it in API Gateway, you don't have to basically rebuild a lot of these pieces. It's uh, one single place for you to manage all these limits, all these throttling, caching, any of these type types of functionality. I think this is a good point. One of the things I tell people when <clears throat> when they do ask this question, because we have had it asked, you know, hey, why don't I just use an ALB? We, we heard the, I, I saw the term on Twitter, uh, it, 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 is API Gateway just an HTTP bridge? You know, yeah. well, <laughs> no, it's not. It's obviously much more than that. And what the, the advice that I give people is, is take a look in your Lambda and see how much logic are you handling that can be rolled off to API Gateway? Uh, how much are you? How much of the wheel are you reinventing, right? Uh, and so, what I encourage people to do: look, are you handling authorization there? Are you handling routing? Are you handling, you know, some kind of maybe you're trying to, you know, you connect to cash or something like that, where where people just don't understand the power of API Gateway. And, and then, you know, as plug as this may sound, I would really encourage you to look at episode one that Alan and I did uh, for Happy Little APIs because we talked through. I mean, literally, the session's called, hey, I didn't know API Gateway could do that. And and a lot of what we run with is is awareness. Did you know it could do this? Because when you are paying for something like that, if it's just proxying and you're never going to go beyond that, then maybe it is ALB. But the reality is, most of the time, you're going to find, hey, I want to take advantage like the things you guys said, the WAF, the caching, the, the security, the offloading, the SSL, you know, those kind of things. Um, and, and API Gateway can do that. And, and it gives you, you know, as a developer, I, I see a lot of developers, well, this is just where we're starting. But the reality is, if you, and, and I'm not saying you should have it all, I mean, it's great if you can have it all planned out, but there are some key things that you want to look at. How can I grow and scale? And I think I think you all touch touch on that as well. So, um, great uh, great information. Um, okay, um, I will say this before we go on to our next question. I'm, I'm there should not be pineapple on pizza. That seems to be the argument that's going on in the chat. Oh, channel. why? I totally disagree. No, no disagree. Hawaii, that's great. Chad, can you mute them? <laughs> okay, great. Pineapple on pizza is not right. So <laughs> now Simon thinks you guys are all on his side. So all right, so. Talked about ALB and things like that. Uh, and if anybody has any questions here, let me hang on a second here. Okay. All right, so so here's a question. Maybe I'm, and I'll let's see what you guys, maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Or maybe I'm misunderstanding what API Gateway is, but isn't it actually a free web hosting service or web hosting? Okay. So, all right, so I, I'll take this one. I, I got this one. So API Gateway is the front door. I mean, it really is. It's the front door that allows you to to route your your requests. You know, like we talked about, WebSocket, REST API. Uh, but it's not it's not a hosting service. Now, in the back end, we've seen people build websites in Lambda, where they actually generate out their HTML with Lambda. Uh, I encourage that not to be the way you go either, unless you do need to render you know dynamic data. More what I what really the modern way of doing that is to build what's called a SPA or a single page application, and host all of that in an S3 bucket. So that's that's your hosting service, S3, that's incredibly scalable. And then your back end is, is API Gateway and Lambda, or you know, dare I say, API Gateway and Fargate, and API Gateway and really anything else. The beauty of API Gateway is you can point it at just about anything, external and internal. I have an API Gateway pointed to my microwave right now. It doesn't do anything, but it can do it. <laughs> so that's a little exaggeration, but you really do have a lot of power uh, in fact, later on, we're going to be talking about how to do external services uh, in, in one of our in one of the one of our episodes. So hopefully that clears it up for you on what API Gateway is. Um, and actually, our developer portal is uh, built exactly like what you mentioned: is a serverless S3 website. Yeah. The all the code is in S3. We have DynamoDB for identities, and then we also have Lambda functions that do a lot of these dynamic type yeah. information. That's and right. All fronted by API Gateway. 
That's right, and we have some comments saying, you know, I have uh, customers using React with server-side rendering, absolutely doable through Lambda. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad pattern at all. There's sometimes you have to do server-side rendering. You can't get away from it, right? But so, so you can do that, that kind of rendering on Lambda, and it, it absolutely has the power. In fact, if you go to CodeStar, one of the templates is how to run a, a um, an express application right out of a Lambda. Yeah, um, so and it, and in fact, it's a monolithic app. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, whether you want to go with that or not, uh, you know, that's, that's your choice. But It gives it you is, the ability to lift and shift. Exactly. And and so, that's exactly. Like, so it's, it, it really should only be used for lift and shift. Like if, you're, um, if you have an existing express application and you wanted to take advantage of, of uh, Lambda and API Gateway and sort of get all the benefits of like scale to zero, um, which is one of the, you know, the big things for serverless, um, absolutely like the serverless express is a great way to is a great way to do that but if you're building a brand new application um, definitely not something that I would recommend as a as a starting point um, uh, for for new applications mm -hmm. yeah. okay excellent yeah so I, I have an interesting question here uh, question not sure it's a, it's a uh, it's attached I got the old man eyes going on here seriously not, not sure it's attached <laughs> on API gateway but I'm but I'm using a lambda function together with the API gateway to call it through HTTPS. Now, if I want my Lambda function to access the outbound internet, so what I'm guessing is they mean make an external call. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs a, a NAT gateway, which is a high, which is high cost just for the function to access uh, outbound traffic. Uh, why is this not included per request price? So I think we need to do some clarification on that. Um, so, so basically, if, as I'm understanding the question, they're asking if I want to make an outbound call with my Lambda, why do I need a NAT gateway, uh, which you don't. Uh, unless so, so unless you've unless you've configured your lambda function to be inside the VPC. There you go, exactly. And so and so oftentimes what we see is is a lot of customers, um, and rightly so, because we spent as a company, uh, AWS has spent a long time kind of like touting the the benefits of of uh, running everything inside the VPC um, uh, for security reasons. But uh, oftentimes uh, the lambda function doesn't have a reason to actually have be in the VPC at all. It's oftentimes not, it's working with services that are public, um, so it might be talking to a DynamoDB table, or it might be talking to S3, which are all publicly available services. So there's nothing inherently um, necessary in, in having that be inside of the VPC. Um, and that would be the only time you would actually need a, a NAT gateway. So yeah. it, so if, unless you're looking at something like you're integrating with, um, so ElastiCache is a common one that sometimes um, customers want to integrate with that unfortunately is only Available in VPC yeah. RDS. Yeah. Um, those, if you if you have one of those, then then unfortunately you're probably yeah. living inside of the VPC. Um, but if you're not using one of those, or you can avoid using one of those uh, for your workload, and the outbound traffic is more important, then then not configuring it, uh, not configuring the lambda in the VPC will negate the need for the for the net gateway. Yeah, and, and we get that question a lot, and, and people will say, well, if I'm in a VPC, do they talk about cold starts and everything like that? And, and the first question I always ask is, why are you on a VPC? Because you should always put everything in a VPC. Okay, yes, but as you already said, Lambda already resides in a VPC. It's just a matter of who's VPC, our VPC. And so you already have that security, that layer of security that's built in. Okay, you had to look like you, you Just wondering like if, um, if they really need the VPC, could they wrap the external endpoint with a private API and call that private API to they get the per request pricing. Yeah, they absolutely could. That's oh, actually that's point. actually that's actually a really great point, Alan. Well, uh, <laughs> say it, hey, one for Alan. Hang on. Okay, say it again. So, so, um, so it sounds like what if you really needed the Lambda to be in a VPC yeah. and you really want to make this external internet call, right. what you could do is create an API gateway uh, configured to be a private API. Uh -huh and the integration to be HTTP to the destination you want to reach, right? Right. And then from the Lambda function, call the private API, which redirects you outside. Nice. And so that way you would, in, in fact, get per request pricing. Yes. We should do an architecture on that. And, and put yeah, out, that'd, be, that'd be a great architecture to show out. Yeah. yeah. And this is my architecture, so, okay. Excellent, all right. Um, let's see what else we've got here. So George is, George is taking care of that. He's, he's also, uh, so here, all right. So what is an example of a tool that a DevOps engineer might make? Uh, I, I'll throw in on this one. Uh, you know, uh, from a serverless, um, and then we'll narrow down to API Gateway in a minute, but from a serverless aspect, man, 
Lambda is the, I, and I call it the Swiss Army knife of AWS. I mean, it does so mm -hmm. much. It can be triggered by so many services. Uh, and that, it, that it's just a common, you know, especially in DevOps when you look at if you use code pipeline, code build, code deploy, those different things, you might tap into something like that. But if we're going specifically API Gateway, obviously API Gateway can be, as you just mentioned, a, a front door to a service that you might need in DevOps, different things like that. Do you guys have anything else you would throw in on that? Um, so, I mean, like, uh, so obviously, uh, API Gateway is itself not serverless, um, so oftentimes we have to um, we have to manage uh, the underlying resources that actually run um, the services that that we are built on top of. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that I actually help uh, build on the team is is a bunch of tools for our operators to actually deal with the infrastructure that we're building. So that's raw EC2 instances and and ALBs, and um, we've actually built APIs for managing um, those kind of uh, those kind of uh, operations. So whether it be um, uh, automating scale up and provisioning of infrastructure, uh, um, which may not be able to be managed in cloud formation for, for a number of reasons, or um, we also have our internal administrative API. So when, okay. when a customer actually comes in and asks us for a limit increase, we actually have an API gateway API that actually our operators use and authenticate against um, to actually increase those limits internally inside of the service. So we so dog, we do food. We dog yeah, food all of, we dog food our services. It's, yeah. a, it's a very common um, thing across Amazon to dog food heavily. Right, and so, so I guess it, it really simplifying that would be if you need an API, if you need to call something, this is the answer. I mean, yep. this really makes it easy. Yep. Uh, internally, externally, it doesn't matter. So, okay, very cool. Um, excuse me one second here. Well, we were in that ops review this morning where we were talking about that one service that moved from Elasticash to putting all their data in S3 and running Spark jobs on top of it. Yeah, exactly. And that's another great example of where you could be doing large scale uh, DevOps operations against how your fleet's being utilized. Now customers are using your fleet, you could put an API in front of that to then talk to EMR and run jobs in the background. Well, I mean, and, it, and if, the, if they had built it using API Gateway from the, from, from the get-go, then they could have actually done a shift um, on the back end as well. So, yeah. I mean, that's oh, the, yeah, totally. so I mean, it's like yeah. if you build, like, one of the benefits of, of, um, of building uh, services like this is, is that if you use API Gateway as the front end, um, you can change out the back end yeah. uh, without without yeah. necessarily changing the contract with your customers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so whether it's like you're changing from a legacy application to Lambda, or Lambda to Fargate, or Fargate to Lambda, or however it right. is that you're put, you're you're changing out mm -hmm. that back end, you still have that same API contract, which is yeah. uh, which is really great. That, yeah, and that's the so yeah, and I think you and I touch on it in one of our episodes is the strangler pattern. Yes, mm -hmm. and and the API gateway is just prime for that, you know. Uh, and, and it's funny, and I've, I've every summit I've spoken at, uh, I end up having. So, have you have you tried the AP or the Strangler pattern? What is that? So you explain it, and I'll explain it really quick. Is you wrap your legacy system with API Gateway, and so your your customer is unaware. The contract's still the same. They're they're unaware of that change going on. Handle it with DNS, right? And then as you can separate those services out and put them on, on Lambda or Fargate or, or, or Lambda, um, it will actually, you can route it through uh, API Gateway. Again, your customer's unaware. So eventually, without with very minimal downtime, you've been able to peel those services off, put them in a microservice, and then you can turn that bad boy off and on you go. Yep. Uh, and that light comes on to go, hey, hey, we could do something like that. So uh, very cool. Um, here's a, and I don't know if we necessarily have the answer to this, but it's, it is a good question, something to think about. Since, uh, in the API gateway, AWS SDK, or I guess SDK in general, there's no function to test whether an API key is valid. Is this a potential feature? Um, so an API key is only valid within the context of a usage plan, and the usage plan has to be associated with a stage. Um, so yes, I could see a use case for wanting to be able to test that without actually invoking the API. Um, but that, yeah, so that would definitely be something we could consider as a feature. Okay. Um, it is not something that is available today. You, you literally have to use the key, yeah, you yeah, use yeah. the key and invoke the API and that's- Let's See if it works. That's really okay. the only mechanism All right righty. now. Okay, makes sense. All righty. So while, while, like I said, George is again, doing a great, uh, great job here answering questions, I'll, um, couple other things that we've had uh, sent in. So I'm just gonna make this um, kind of kind of a, a broad stroke question, but throttling, 
why? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, there's a number of reasons why you uh, and, and say, I don't mean the throttling bad. I actually like it. I know probably the way I sound it, but we get that question a lot. Why? Why is there throttling? What do I do with it? Well, Bob has some pretty strong feelings here. So. Okay. <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, so API Gateway offers a bunch of different throttlings, uh, throttling levels. Uh, so, uh, the one that a lot of customers have their first, might have their first interaction with is sort of the default account level throttling. Yeah. Um, and, and every AWS service has this at some, at some level. Mm -hmm. um, so, both on, uh, so we have uh, obviously throttling uh, on our control plane operations. So, how fast you can create APIs, how fast you can deploy them. Um, that's that's kind of distinct from sort of the throttling limits you get uh, out of the box for for your API. Um, so by default, you get up to 10,000 RPS um, on invocations of your API, and that covers both uh, um, REST APIs as, and WebSockets. So um, messages and uh, REST requests uh, count the same towards that limit. Um, and so that's the sort of oftentimes the first uh, um, thing that customers interact with. Now, there's no why to that other than perhaps to protect the customer from themselves, right. um, where it's like perhaps they have a runaway workflow that, that just over overwhelms their, their account level limits. Anything above that account level limit wouldn't be charged. Mm -hmm. um, so the, those requests would generate a 429 response to a caller and, and, um, and, and basically not be billed to the customer. Now. Within that context, there still may be a runaway uh, a runaway caller that the customer does not want that the API owner does not want to pay for. So there might be somebody who is abusing the yeah. access to the API and calling it at a much higher rate than than was intended. Um, and so that's where you might come you come in with uh, API keys and usage plan throttling, where you can actually assert per caller. Uh, call rates uh, on on your caller. So each caller gets a unique API key. You associate that key with a usage plan, and then you can set a rate on that usage plan to say, okay, this guy he pays me nothing. He gets ten RPS. Yeah. This guy pays me a nice big fat contract. He can get a thousand RPS. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, and so like you can and you can kind of you know bucket your your customers appropriately using that mechanism. Um, and sort of then the final uh, uh, final level of throttling is more for protecting back-end resources um, so less of an issue when you're truly serverless but like when we're talking about the strangler pattern when we're kind of like in that sort of intermediate aspect where we have some legacy resources that might be um, that might be uh, not properly scaled or not cloud enabled yeah. um, to, to scale infinitely um, you might need to you might want to protect that that back end from receiving too many requests. And so you can set what we call stage level or method level throttling. So that is literally the number of requests that can go to a, skip, a specific route um, or back end uh, request. So if you know, you've rated this back end at, at uh, you know, 1000 RPS, you just set that like, okay, more than 1000 RPS and we'll just, we'll, fa we'll fail fast and we'll tell our callers that the, the back end is too busy. Um, and the important thing to note there is all three of those I mentioned even with the account level limit, but the the API key limit and the the stage level limit, um, any of those 429s uh, free of charge. So that that we the um, uh, if if you're trying to deal with a um, a high load uh, caller and you're trying to mitigate your costs, uh, that is one way to do that. Excellent. Okay. You guys want to add anything or? I think you covered a lot of it. I, th I think the strangler pattern one is is super important, and and I know we're going to cover this in a future session of the the show. But yeah. the ability to use API Gateway as a front door, not only to your your resources that are running inside of the cloud, but also resources that are running on premise, is is actually a really powerful yeah. pattern for people because it it gives you now a unified front door that can talk to resources wherever they're located. Yep. Uh, yeah. And and so. Some of those resources might be a little bit constrained, as Bob's pointing out. You know, and that, you know, legacy system may only have so many kinds of transactions per second that it can handle before it runs into trouble. So, again, that front door can help protect that resource while integrating it with the rest of your your and infrastructure. You'd much rather that happen at your level, where you can maintain the the errors and and yeah. and gracefully degrade yeah. versus just blowing up on the service you're calling. Yeah, especially if that system fails in yeah. unpredictable ways right. on the back end, like way better to control it at That's the right. front the front door. Yeah. Absolutely. Very cool. All righty. So uh, let me take a look here. I'll ask you guys another question. I'm going to go back here. So 
So following on that, okay, and these two ten, these two of the big questions I get. So the qu next one, why? Okay, WAF, why? I think we kind of yeah. covered that one in the previous question you asked about okay. whether or not you could use WAF um, to protect. Uh, APIs and because basically WAF you can set at the stage level you can basic after that you can set up any rule that WAF supports whether that's okay. IP uh, region regional like geographically region um, user agents any of those you would be able to just put in front of the API gateway and protect that okay. service and when we talk about security we think about it as like an onion right, 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 right. so like security in depth so yeah. WAF is going to be your first layer, and then you have uh, API gateways, auth um, for uh, the internal security, and you could also think about throttling and caching as a different kind of protection as well, yep. whether or not yep. it's going to overwhelm your backend. So, um, different kinds of things in that area. All right, yeah, and so, so just one sort of other no, thing on that on that point. <laughs> so one more other thing on that point is is that oftentimes um, you know maybe again for like security, but sometimes it's uh, maybe not necessarily security per se, but compliance, um, which can be considered as a part of security where right. there's a compliance regime that has very strict standards on um, what uh, what traffic is allowed. Um, so uh, there will oftentimes be uh, contracts that say like, okay, you can have this API, but it can only allow traffic from a certain set of IPs right. for compliance reasons. And so that would be also a, a use case for WAF. All right, so why would I use WAF instead of like a resource policy? Um, so the resource policy uh, will will also do the same thing, okay. um, but the uh, the number of uh, rules that you could fit in that resource policy is much smaller than the number of IP rules that you could configure in a WAF rule. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just throw a bomb right in the middle of you guys and run out the door here. But here's the conversation going on in the window right now, and it has to do with cores. Okay. okay. Which okay. cores? Everybody loves cores, right? We actually, and, and I don't remember the, I think you and I covered cores somewhat. I think it was on the Shut the Front Door episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah Shut yeah. the Front Door. So I really, and, and we could go into that, but I'm going to have you guys expand on cores in just a minute. But I would encourage you to watch the Shut the Front Door. Uh, you want to say it again? Shut the front there door. There it is, yes. Um, where where uh, we talk about cores and what kind of is your responsibility, what API gateway can handle, what happens in the Lambda and stuff. But do one of you guys want to kind of kind of maybe expand on that a little bit on on just, I'm not actually go through every configuration setting, but kind of talk me through the process of, of where cores is going to be handled. Um, sure, I can I, I can go through that. So okay. um, uh, I, I will I will apologize. Um, uh, the the console experience uh, that oh, offers the uh, one click <laughs> cores um, experience um, leaves a little bit to be desired and and we we acknowledge that and we we are aware of it and we are trying to address it but um, that 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 is oftentimes where a lot of developers start um, and assume that that is going to do all the right things. Right. Um, it does not. Uh, so what that is actually doing is um, actually making a bunch I'm of looking at Ryan right now. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it's <laughs> true. It's totally true. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it uh, it makes a bunch of calls to API Gateway to configure. Um, so it configures the the options preflight uh, method. Um, so if your if your uh, your API requires a preflight request, it will configure that options as a mock integration um, so that you it and it will configure the the headers to return for that for that pre-flight request. It will also attempt to add uh, header mappings yeah. for for your methods. So if you had like a get, or if, even if you had an any, um, uh, if you had a get or a, a put or a post or a, et cetera, it would try to add the header mappings for those methods as well. Um, where this falls down is for the proxy. Um, and uh, for the proxy, those header mappings don't actually mean anything. Um, so unfortunately, the service will will happily accept those as uh, as configuration, or will happily yeah. say like, "Yep, you can set that header mapping, no problem." But what actually happens is is that we will still only return uh, yeah. whatever is actually returned from your Lambda function. Okay. So. Uh, um, so for preflight requests, the mock the mock will handle that. But if you're using the proxy, 
you are still 100% responsible for returning um, the headers, the, the appropriate course headers from your Lambda function. Now, if you're not using the proxy, then those header mappings would also get applied. Uh, so if you were using straight up VTL Lambda integration. Um, the final piece uh, um, to sort of get your complete cores uh, integration is the gateway responses, um, which mm. is also not configured today by the one-click uh, experience, because the one-click experience came out before gateway responses was a thing. Um, and so that handles any error messages that uh, or error codes that would happen inside of API Gateway before uh, any of your routing information would happen. So that's things like um, 403 access denied or a 500 if God forbid there was an there was an error with uh, with API Gateway um, or you know the WAF rule like the WAF rule was denied or your authorization returned a 401 unauthorized all of these things um, you would have to configure via gateway responses okay. um, and so you can either sort of configure the two default gateway responses um, so the default 5xx and the default 4xx uh, if you don't care about sort of the um, uh, the individual yeah. sort of error codes, yeah. if you don't need to customize any of those, you're gonna set those two and forget it. Um, but if you need to sort of customize, like if you need to customize the 401 to send them to mm -hmm. a redirect mm -hmm. for a login page as an example, then you would just need to make sure that you add the headers there specifically yeah, as well. Yeah, the location header and the, yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. yeah. And okay. a bit of a more advanced scenario that I've seen customers do is that if you go through the console today, there's a field that says, hey, this is the domain that's coming through. Return this in the header, um, in the accept header. If you actually go in, as Bob mentioned, really this is implemented using uh, a transform, a template, right? If you go into that, you can actually write some logic that says, hey, I, you can actually make it more flexible, for example. Right. Like, for example, if I have um, multiple example.com domains that I want to this API to serve, I can say, you know, if it's coming from um, a.example.com, b.example.com, and c.example.com, just return whatever is coming back. So okay. so then it's uh, less hard-coded than the console experience. Or, or, or requiring a star. Yeah, or yeah, requiring yeah, a star. Which is the other thing that we Security talked about. Security to the star, yeah, right. exactly, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, you guys, you know, yeah, man, this has been an awesome episode. We are actually out of time, believe it or not. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it up here. I know it, it makes a lot of you cry. Yes, I know you love my shirt. I appreciate that you love my shirt. I've had a lot of comments on that. Uh, there should be no pineapple on pizza. And oh. I think that covers no. everything. I think there's some debate on that. Uh, I want to say, say thanks to, to the team here, to Paul and Charles and Patrick and Eric. And I'm sure I'm missing somebody. And James Beswick, who's sitting off to the side, who's killing it. Uh, and George for answering all the questions online. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is your first time. You get a phone tool. Oh, so yeah, nice. what's up? Oh, yeah, man. so uh, nice. yeah, what's up? And you guys already got yours. So. Yeah, we did. Um, yeah, so until next time, we are actually doing this again on August 13th. We're gonna be talking about Ship It on how to deploy applications with uh, API Gateway. Uh, I am EDJ Geek on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, uh, I talk a lot about Twitter uh, or serverless. I talk a lot about my kids, so good with the bad. You take it. Uh, I also talk a lot about pizza, apparently. So thank you, and we are out. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.